think uh, my questions will be very simple because uh, the point is to give a uh, microphone or give the floor to you. So I would be very curious if you could very simply comment uh, maybe uh, how from your personal perspective, but mainly from the perspective of your field of study and especially I would say more precisely from your uh, approach to, to ethnography and anthropology, you would comment this, this film of Renzo Martens because he, he is actually representing or uh, kind of almost uh, mocking the, the, one would say, the, the archaic archaic colonizer or the person that, that would come into the, in, in Africa and, and play this, this role of white colonizer coming to Congo. So I would be curious, how would you kind of unfold uh, the film and uh, what would be uh, your more precise uh, uh, comment of, of specialist of, of, from, your, from your field? I don't know who, who wants to, to start, it's really up to you to feel, <laughs> if you uh, will come. Hmm? Okay, nobody else will. Um, uh, thank you. It's 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 great to uh, to be here, and I, I stayed up late last night uh, watching that film, and in consequence, I didn't sleep uh, much. <laughs> it was a very uh, it's a very uh, engaging and and difficult film, and on at one level, uh, it it picks out some recognizable, uh, in a sense. Uh, uh, flaws in, in, in the logic of international development. Um, I think I have worked on uh, development projects, not in Africa, mostly, mostly in, in Asia, mostly in India. And I think this fundamental point about um, those who are um, honored as the givers are the, are the most, uh, are the greatest beneficiaries of, of, of international aid. I think that's a point that is, that is well made and remains, uh, and remains true. I, I did research and, and looked at, worked on an aid, aid project and you could say precisely that the, the percentage of, of resources that went through, uh, you'll remember that moment when he's on the phone to somebody who's written an article talking about technical assistance and it's true a lot of aid was going to technical assistance because people were funding uh, UK uh, institutions, in my case, uh, to develop consultancies and provide support and so on. The, 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 the irony of um, aid being uh, um, those, those, the, the, the gift of aid um, being given when, when the primary beneficiaries are those who are acknowledged as, as, as the givers. So I think that's something that is, um, that is it's an aspect that's, that, that, that's picked out. Also, I think something that becomes very clear in the film is that aid agencies operate in a sphere of their own making, uh, their own self-marketing, and uh, their own self-referencing. And that the world understood and defined in terms of the aid agency world has a, a, a often a, a blind and, and, and an unknowing, an ignorant, uh, an ignorance of the realities that it is engaging with. And I think there are various structures that perpetuate, um, in a sense, encourage organizations to have or invest in uh, a simplified version of the problems that they're addressing, so as the version of the world that they want to live, operate within, is one that's consistent with the sorts of solutions uh, or the sorts of inputs or the sorts of resources that are uh, that can be delivered through aid programs. So I think there's the the creation of artificial worlds um, that, that 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 justify and, and validate um, interventions. Now these are quite easy characterizations to to make of the aid industry. And having worked within the aid industry, I think many within it. Uh, would also recognize those, even while uh, endeavoring to, to, to not be bound and constrained by them. So I think there's an element of, 
of simplification that one has to uh, take on board when, 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 um, uh, when watching the film. Um, and i probably maybe say something more about that sort of thing later on, but let me not hold this microphone for too long. Thanks. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just make a few uh, quick comments, and uh, I, I will admit that I'm one of those people who is guilty of providing technical assistance. Uh, it wasn't particularly well-paid technical assistance, but uh, I, I have been part of this aid industry as well. Um, I think, as, as I was watching this, and, and I don't know how it escaped me, but I saw it for the first time a couple of days ago, and as I was watching it, I was completely in agreement with a lot of these critiques. This is, these are things we know very well. These are things which anthropologists have researched and written very nuanced books about. Um, and I, I can't argue with the, uh, the substance of the critique, except to say that uh, I think what really required a delicate, nuanced touch is sort of given the treatment of a sledgehammer in, in this instance. And as I said, in, in some instances it's oversimplifications, in some instances it's, uh, I think, an un, a failure to recognize that there are actually a lot of folks within this aid industry who are desperately trying to change it. I would be one included who, uh, who has taken part in these projects, mainly in Eastern Europe. And, and has tried to sort of avoid these things. And uh, as David mentioned, this idea of the, uh, the donor priorities and, and how uh, things are set. And, and what, I, what I scribble down here is basically this difference between what is needed and what is fundable. What is something that a donor can say, this is a priority and we want to fund this. And in order for that to happen, you have to have a set deliverable, and you have to be able to check the box to say that this has happened. And in terms of the kind of aid which is really necessary, and in this case I, I, do, uh, I do work in uh, public health and infectious disease, what is usually needed is complicated and difficult to, to simply check a box, whereas what is oftentimes delivered is something, for example, a, a building. There's a building which is constructed, and on this date you can say that this has been given. But is, is the building what was actually needed, or is there something that's much more complicated and, and more difficult to give that, uh, that's missing? So, so I think in this instance, um, there, there's a mismatch between what, in some instances, the sort of aid which is being delivered and the sort of aid which would be most useful, as determined by the folks who are actually uh, living there. And, and this was, uh, I, this is something that I think we, maybe we don't spend enough time uh, thinking about, is actually what do people see as being actually needed in a place. Um, the technical assistance industry is very strong and we provide a, a, lots of things which we say that other places need, but oftentimes this is a one-way loop and we're not receiving what it is that people actually want. And if aid truly is supposed to better people's lives, then there has to be this two-way communication. And, and I think this is something where we do need to, to have a lot more uh, input in. But uh, I'll save other comments for later. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I think this was, um, at least for me, um, you know, we know the critiques that were presented of international humanitarianism, of development aid, and so on. Uh, but it was nevertheless a pretty overwhelming film, partly because of the way that the, um, the visual images, in some ways, uh, especially of the children who are, who are malnutrition and the you know, ability in some ways to show what a wound actually looks like versus just reading about a wound, um, in some ways is what I would call a kind of inordinate knowledge that is we, it's so overwhelming in some ways that, you know, one doesn't quite know what to do with that. And I like, I, I like the critique that, um, which is, Others have made it, but I still think there's two very important parts of the critique. You know, one is, of course, the whole idea of the white man as the one who comes to rescue. 
Um, so I, I've been very struck by the fact that when the Ebola epidemic happened, you know, we had a huge number of people taking, you know, I, I won't name names, but people like basically saying we are the ones who led um, the uh, entire um, try to contain the epidemic. And there was no mention of the fact that the majority of doctors who actually worked during the Ebola epidemic were Ugandans. Right? And so there's something very interesting about the manner in which the critique is also the particular narrative structure of the white man coming and you know, providing in some ways um, the rescue. Um, I would have, of course, been very interested in thinking that now, for example, you do have huge uh, aid projects from China. Uh, you have in the Middle East the entire issue of Islamic humanitarianism, in which Saudi Arabia has been very active in terms of Turkey has been very active in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of not humanitarian aid of the international humanitarian sort, but certainly a particular kind of humanitarian aid. And I think these are very interesting questions that will emerge that once you displace or you make more plural these, uh, the humanitarian structures which are in place, what you actually get. Um, the second point I want to make, and uh, that's after which I'll stop, is that you know, in some ways it announces itself as a film. Now, we know that in, unlike a painting, the kind of uh, frame in the film is much more mobile. So you can, um, you know, you can just see that there is a certain sense in which what you are seeing is already seen through the camera. And so that kind of distancing in a certain sense of the, the intimacy with the image, but the idea that this is the, the cinema itself telling you I'm cinema. Now, we know that this technique of placing that within the frame um, is a very effective way by which, in some ways, the illusion of the intimacy with the narrative and with the image is often uh, destroyed. For example, in very classic films, um, you know, classic Hollywood films, you would have the screen, and the screen might receive impressions within, within the cinematic screen itself, right? Here, what was very interesting was the kind of ironies which were also performed. So you had enjoy poverty as you know written uh, in ways in which it becomes part of the cinematic structure itself, and also the creation in a certain way of um, particular kinds of ironies in which uh, the filmmaker's own presence is something which is also. Um, uh, severely problematized, so to say, so that uh, so that you don't end up, and that's what I liked about it, was that you don't actually end up thinking, oh, I've had a documentary which has shown me exactly how things are over there. You know that in a certain sense this is a commentary, but it's a commentary in which false intimacy is also in some ways being created. So I could say more on it, but I think that what for me was very interesting was to think of this not just as, it's not like I, I read the same things in academic papers or in newspaper reports. So what is it that the medium of the film actually does over here? And you know, I think a very interesting thing there was, um, you know, we could go into the specific scenes um, in, in some ways, but the very interesting thing was the way in which you're constantly being teased into thinking what what is it that's not in the frame, you know, so that there is a question of what is, you know, what they, for example, when there's, uh, there, there's a scene where, um, you know, where this man says, yes, uh, we know that malnutrition children are much more in the, among workers employed by the company, and outside in other farms, you don't actually get that many malnutrition children. There's a reference to something outside the frame, and it would actually be very, very uh, interesting to think uh, in what kind of way things which are outside the frame are both kind of brought closer to us, but also something which is excluded in some ways because of the manner um, in which the cinematic screen, so to say, actually 
um, operates and the manner in which the, the shifting angles of the camera, for example, uh, play with this question of how close you are to what you're seeing and how distant you are from what you're seeing. I, I might have more to say later, but this is the end. Uh, <clears throat> my perspective is uh, uh, really a perspective of uh, of somebody who examines how films are made and how 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 they construct the narrative and this film is quite precious for me because it's in constant dialogue with our expectations with our spectator spectators expectations and uh, it offers really wide uh, possibilities to question the problematics of uh, uh, images and industry of poverty and industry of poverty with the images. And uh, for me, this film is a really very precise gesture very conscious gesture of somebody who knows that to uh, show the poverty to the world has a long tradition and this tradition has been kind of exploited. We know now that the things we see are not as such as we see them and we know that the camera and somebody behind uh, frame the reality and that the reality is much more uh, complicated than what's been showing to us. And I think Renzo Martins is very well, uh, very aware of that. So this gesture really could be discussed for others, but uh, to make it simple, I, I, I think he really, in the first half of the film, offers uh, offers us to think actually how the images of the of the the how the images how how the how the images of huh. how the images <laughs> the images <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think maybe the batteries. Battery, battery. Images on batteries. Uh, is in the first half where he stands uh, or his two cameras are more, uh, we used to say, observative. Uh, he confronts us with uh, with. Uh, with the fact how, how, or how are the images of poverty and of the third world uh, part of our uh, our first world? What are the connections uh, uh, of of uh, of the images of the of the third world? Uh, how did we inhabit them? How did we make them alive? And how, how did we came to this tradition? And it's, uh, he's playing with it because he is, he is thema thematizing media as such, and that's a very important le level of that film. Another important level, and that's again the gesture I'm talking about, is, uh, is that he is uh, constantly uh, showing us the problematics of representations representations of media, representations of author, of himself, and of the narrative we get, and of the sense we get from that. And that's very important, and I think he is very brave to do this gesture up to the point where he examines the possibility of engaged art, or of engaged meant as such. He, as, a, as somebody with a camera, or anybody with a camera, when when we uh, start to shoot, we already exploit the reality. We already exploit, and that's the that's the question of, of power of somebody who is taking pictures. Uh, 
and he is really talking about that. So I think for me this film is a lot about how can we talk about it? How can we talk about Congo and, and this terrible holocaust happening there a uh, hundred years and um, what what might be the gesture of, of artists going there and this is this is his try. Um, I'm here from the position of our. Um, is it broken? I'm here in the position uh, with our gallery. Uh, my colleague is here in the audience, so she, she can maybe uh, She can maybe add something um, if I say something wrong. <laughs> uh, and uh, our research project is uh, concentrated on uh, do com contemporary documentarism or just the documentary strategies in contemporary video. And for this research, this movie or this art piece is pretty cr crucial uh, because, as was already mentioned here, uh, he's showing the position of himself, the media, and for me, coming from the art world, it's very important that he's showing also how this works uh, in relation in relationship to art world itself. So you can find there many references to visual art as, as it is the neon sign, of course. Uh, but also himself as a just some persona, like artist, um, like some kind of dramatic, uh, romantic artist uh, traveling on the uh, Black River or something like that. And uh, the last thing which is very important and it's creating these connections uh, between the, the subject or the object of the film, the film itself, the author, and the last thing is the uh, audience. So uh, for me, it's very important to see how Renzo Martins is referring to audience itself, uh, and uh, how he is making visible the secondary weavers in Europe. So he's pretty well aware, and also like um, he's showing you that this film is not made. Uh, for the object of the film. It's made for the people who are watching it, so you are becoming um, participant of this. You are, and that's the point that he's showing you that be become, being the participant or being the viewer, you are becoming the participant of the whole complex network of these relationships that are creating also the poverty in Congo. So I don't know if it's... Um, and... Um, I think that's, yeah, for now, what I wanted to say. Maybe if you can, you, you were mentioning shortly, but my question would be, if you can develop a little bit, uh, some of you, a comment of uh, actually uh, the methodology, the way how he approaches uh, people and how he approaches uh, poor people and uh, dying child and suffering uh, humans, because this was a subject of critique of, of certain, of course, Especially, uh, of course, as ethnographers and anthropologists, the methodology and how to, how to uh, actually behave and what are the codes and, and methodologies. Of course, it's transgressed because we can claim it's an artistic piece, it's art. But it, was, it is something that was very highly discussed also in art fields. You know, even art, it should, be, it should have a kind of autonomy in terms of, of transgressing certain social taboos, etc. But there is a kind of inside healthy morality in art field, you know, saying, for example, this is transgressing, you know, because there was also another case uh, of, of Kevin Carter, I don't know if you know the case of, of South, uh, South African photographer, who, who actually waited 20 minutes to take a picture of a dying child, yes. then he took the picture and he got the Pulitzer Prize, and then a year after, he was a big activist and really a big person, and a year after Pulitzer Prize he committed suicide because all the people were uh, kind of pointing at him, saying, you know, you, you were watching this child dying for 20 minutes, and he couldn't bear it, he, he couldn't after one year. So, again, this, this question was brought when, when Martin's films came out, because people were uh, criticizing very much his kind of cynical, non-human approach to, to suffering. So, what, what would be your comment? And also maybe in, in connection with, with the tradition of, of uh, documentary in anthropology or uh, tomography, actually. Um, well, I'm probably not the best person to comment on that, but so I hope it'll move along the line. But just to say one thing that did strike me is that 
this is presented to us as a parody. It's presented to us as, uh, as, a, as a Western audience for our education, for our self-parody, for our, and in a sense it, it, it loops in a way that the background and others are certainly used for that purpose. I mean, explicitly there's a, there's a sort of honesty about that, but that honesty doesn't uh, remove or absolve the filmmaker from the costs um, of, of, of that, um, that cynical um, use of those, uh, of, of those participants in the process. So, in a way, although it parodies the, uh, the white Western uh, aid worker, it also reproduces uh, the white Western actor um, communicating and producing something for consumption by the white Western audience. And therefore, in a sense, rather than just critiquing, it also reproduces uh, what it's critiquing and doesn't at any point engage, except ironically and laughably uh, and in a sense misleadingly, with the real life dilemmas and, 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 and issues that those who are the backdrop of the, of the film's concerns uh, that, that confront their lives. So I think that would be um, the one thing that uh, uh, strikes me. Yeah, I was thinking <clears throat> of something similar that, and, and I think as ethnographers, we're, this is something that we're very, very sensitive to, is, is how we represent other folks and, and how we try to preserve people's dignity and humanity. And, and as I was watching this, um, what I, was, what I was seeing was that he's using these people as props. This person is here to, to fulfill some role. So he's stretching the skin of the malnourished child. He's taking the clothes off of the one to show this wound. And what, what it left me thinking was, is, is this all that, that we get? That this child is here to demonstrate this point? And do they have humanity outside of this? And, as an, as an ethnographer, this is something that I, I really agonize about, to show people as full human beings and, and to try to preserve that dignity. So for me, this was particularly troubling to watch uh, people who are suffering being reduced and, and used to prove, as I said before, a very legitimate point, but nonetheless, uh, one that left me feeling uncomfortable and, uh, and, and a bit disappointed and a bit saddened by uh, by the use of these folks without providing any context other than this is a dying child, this is an impoverished person. And uh, this was something that troubled me. Um, so let me say as an ethnographer, when you are looking at suffering, there is no way you are going to come out of it clean. Mm. Right? So it's not just the filmmaker, it's the anthropologist, just the ethnographer. So, you know, who's, they, I mean, I take that as such a fundamental point. Um, you know, Gandhi used to say that your hands will always be dirty if you're done. If you, you know, if, you, if your hands are completely clean, you've never actually done anything, right? So in that sense, I'm, um, yeah, you know, I, I come at it at a different angle because I think if it makes you feel uncomfortable, it's precisely what it's, meant to do. I mean, it seems to me that it's actually, uh, you know, it's impact that, um, uh, okay, let, let me step back. First, I don't think it's representational uh, categories are that clear to me. I don't think it's really about representation. It seems to me that it's much more in a certain sense about what kind of cinematic distance and what kind of cin cinematic closeness can you know, actually create to these particular images. And so the feeling of nausea that overtakes you um, in actually looking at these particular images is exactly what happens in a fieldwork situation. You know, so you, you know that there are these things that are happening. You also know that at some time you are going to go away. And you know, one of my problems in my fieldwork has always been that I can't go away, right? So I tend to do fieldwork for 15 years, 16 years, 17 years. I just cannot dissociate my, you know, myself, which is not a, it's not a solution to the problem. It's simply that, um, I think that the demand in a certain sense on the film to somehow 
uh, be, uh, you know, uh, uh, cater in some ways to well-defined sensitivities is precisely what to me it was actually um, questioning, which is in some ways, you know, um, bringing to the fore what, you know, I think what as anthropologists or ethnographers we experience every day, which is really that in the end, should I really be writing about this? You know, why should I be writing about this? How should I be writing about this? But more than writing, I mean, it's also, let's say, anthropological knowledge is secreted in several contexts and several spaces. It's not just the act of writing. So, I mean, I think I'd be very interested in the question of uh, what the making of the film itself actually did. So I'm not sure mm. that these are people who were props in that sense. Um, so, so at least for me, I think it left me um, with much more complicated emotions uh, than, uh, than the ones. And you know, this particular reference that you made to that uh, film with the dying child and the vulture waiting to which was in the New York Times. Um, I mean, the, the cr critical question there was that, um, you know, how do you actually deal with this kind of overwhelming reality? And that if there is this kind of overwhelming reality, maybe you could save this one child, but you know, you know that there are going to be a next child about whom you probably are not going to be able to do anything. Um, so I think maybe my relation to it was um, more ambivalent, but that my relation to anthropology is more ambivalent. So in some ways, these tend to kind of, you know, I, they, they, they tend to mirror uh, that kind of discomfort that I have with the fact, which is a simple fact of existence, that I live in a world where these things are happening all the time. And however, I might protect myself from thinking, oh, you know, I'm not the one who's done this. The fact of one's complicity in a certain sense was what came out to me, so. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. yeah the, your, what, what you are saying? <laughs> I have a special energy. <laughs> some fight with you. <laughs> this works. Uh, yeah, I have to uh, I have uh, to focus actually that uh, your question was about the methodology because uh, what you are saying is bringing me new um, new perspectives and very interesting how to how to look at the film and I would talk about uh, his documentaristic methodology. Um, I think it's quite clear from the very beginning that his methodology is uh, uh, exposing himself in the middle of the frame and uh, that he is the white man who comes to a black Africa and this white man decided to make up the story about that encounter. And his methodology is to make a film for West audience. Uh, so by watching his film, we are supposed to enjoy the, uh, the poverty. This message is for us. And I think it is the second reading of the film that we are looking at the film about Congo and about the terrible misery, where all of us, we do take a daily part just by, uh, by having uh, telephones, just by having computers, <laughs> using water, whatever. And so his methodology is in a way quite romantic because he is on the journey and he takes his journey quite romantically. I think for all of you, you uh, it, it's, it's so significant how much he reminds us of Klaus Kinski and how much the, the narrative is, is like, uh, like Werner Herzog's films or there is the, it, it's obvious, you cannot miss that. Also with this heavy luggage, 
going through the jungle and, and, and behind the, the methodology is heart of the darkness and uh, it's, it's, this, it's this deep way how to deal with the guilt we can never have a clean hands not possible, not now, not tomorrow not the day after tomorrow, not in one year because of this whole industry which is so structured that we are really a small, we are playing a small part in that. So, and again, his methodology is, he explains that quite clearly in the beginning, when he, he says that he, uh, he wants, wants to set this, this light up, and he wants people to enjoy the moment they are there with joy in their mind and in their heart. And that's his methodology, how to create images about Congo and himself. What I find uh, as a weak point is that I really do not know why he goes to Congo and why he chose uh, to make a film as such there. Because he's Dutch. He's Dutch. He's Dutch. I thought that too, but he's <laughs> Dutch. No. <laughs> not Belgian. That's interesting, right? Yeah, I was thinking, uh, for me, you said that his methodology is his, his irony or is cynical. I don't think it's cynical. I don't agree with that, with that point. I think he is really making self-references to this industry uh, of poverty. Parody is what I'm suggesting. Mm? I said it was a parody. Parody. Yeah, which is, you know, it's like, that's why I think it, it, it is a parody. Hmm. Anyway, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, I, I, I don't think that. I take it too seriously, probably. Um, mm, and his methodology is quite, uh, I was about to say that it's quite tough. For me, the hardest a scene was when he feeds the family in the end and first thing you know that this gesture really warms them up they are so happy they can eat and you can feel it and you can see it from their faces but you know that there is a huge village around which is not being feeded and I really I was shocked by the fact that he had courage to soothe this logo on the shirt of this girl. That was so astonishing for me and disgusting, actually disgusting. And I had to think about it a lot and I was thinking when Leopold II had Congo like uh, his heritage, I think this was a gesture towards that, you know. But uh, Renzo is not a uh, Persian. <laughs> So, methodology, yeah, irony, irony and references. Um, yeah, so, so first, um, I, I agree with Viola with the irony and parody, because um, I think when we look um, further from the content or the objects of the film, which is really interesting for me when you when you see this uh, piece or video in the context of uh, documentary movies or in the cinema. But he, um, Renzo Martin, strictly says in many interviews that this is an art piece. It's a uh, and it's very important this because. Um, the context or the, the realm of art world uh, allows you to do things that are non ethical actually, and uh, which is problematic also. And he, he is very aware of this problematic because he, he kind of he, he's aware of this audiences and he he has this you know like an author of this film he has this contract with audience which is very liberal. This contract uh, is one side, on one side that he can do anything. Uh, he can shoot images that are really devastating for people watching it. 
And on the other side, this contract um, is, the, is the audience which can do anything, can do something with it, but doesn't have to at all, of course. So for me, it's important this relationship to audience and this um, very open question of ethics and the changing of context, because when you see it in the context of gallery, you're naturally looking at the medium itself, but when you're looking at this, I don't know, in, in the context of a yeah, so, so-called documentary movie, it could be really different. So you would see the content, you would see the poverty, you would see the conditions, political and economic conditions of Congo. But I don't think it's, this is something what he wanted to show, because I think in terms of the going to documentary movie, it's a, I would say, very bad movie, because it shows you something that you really know, you know these images, uh, you know uh, the situation of the people. So for me it's more important to stick with the, with the medium of the video itself and um, with the ethic and with his own agenda. I think for, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I think, I don't know but, you know. for Renzo Martins maybe uh, making this movie would or was also devastating because as you probably know uh, this was one of his last movies and then he moved to Congo and then he started his own initiative uh, working with the people there and making art pieces with them and selling them in the western art uh, market which is also a question for me quite problematic because this status quo uh, visible in the movie is that you have your own agenda only if you can sell something in the market which I don't know if <laughs> this should be the result of, or the uh, emancipation process Maybe. So maybe if you have just last last comments because I think it would be it would be good fair to open up the floor for the questions and comments because uh, we all saw the film and we all I think feel a certain need to to add or to say something. So if you still have a comment, you are welcome. To, yeah. So it would be I think interesting to share your comments on what, what has been said here or uh, on, the, on the film. If you are not too tired, it was a long evening, but it's, I think a lot has been said. I have also some, still some questions, but uh, it's, I think, more important to, to engage in a kind of debate because uh, you are artists or maybe ethnographers or maybe just, just spectators or <laughs> random visitors, I don't know. So you are really welcome. Questions? My question. Uh, comments concerning international NGOs. Actually, when I saw the movie, I didn't see international NGOs. I saw UN. And UN, of course, their supporting costs are different from other NGOs. Yes. I don't want to see my help. <coughs> yeah. Uh, that's my first time. Great. When I saw, when I watched the movie, I saw UN agencies and I didn't see international NGOs. UN supporting costs for NGOs, uh, UN supporting costs are quite different from international NGOs. International NGOs, which are obliged to donors, ECHO, DFID, USAID, they have strict line how much they can take out of it. Usually it's like 10, 15 percent. So the movie a little bit, let's say, oversimplifies that, yes, and a little bit overstate the argument that international NGOs take 90 percent. There was Mitzel Sofontaine, yeah. there was the uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, that's a... Good yeah, example. Doctors Without Borders, they, they even don't get money from ECHO, from DFID, from USAID, and they, but they have their own strict rules how much they can take out of the money or how much they cannot take out of the money. Yes. Uh, back to the comment of, 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 uh, of Das, of, of, Lindy, of, of Professor Das, uh, you have many actors now in the humanitarian sector from Turkey, from China, from India. The thing with them is that they are not obliged with humanitarian laws and humanitarian charts, and they are not even obliged to the new tool, which is called like Grand Per Gain, which is tool from from uh, from. Uh, Istanbul Summit, Humanitarian Summit in 2017, which again says you like how much money can be used for program part of project, from program part and also for supporting costs. So it's 
it, there are new actors, it's starting to work and big money are going into the business. However, the question is partiality and neutrality of those actors. So that is the question actually, what is better if the NGOs do that, Western NGOs do that, or if they don't do that, and what will be the consequences for that? Somebody wants to comment or answer? Um, I think you're, um, I mean, I'm not doubting or disputing um, the fact that there are, um, let's say that if USA gives you uh, money, the kinds of conditionalities that come with it, uh, you know, especially right now, for example, um, uh, anyone who is dealing with even local NGOs who are providing um, um, health care but are also providing abortion uh, cannot actually use USAID money at all. So those kinds of conditionalities in a way have their ripple effects on um, you know on uh, forms of local activisms in uh, pretty strong ways. I think the point that I was trying to make was that there's an interesting difference uh, between the underlying, so you said about the heart, the, that you can't miss the connections with Heart of Darkness, for example. So there is a kind of longer, more stable narrative of the manner in which it's the, wise, the ironization of um, the underlying deeper narrative of the white man as the savior um, seems to me to be the, the, the point about this. I think that what I, was, what I was trying to say was, it's very interesting how the other forms of humanitarianism, which are very alive, I mean, if you are, um, you know, if you think about Saudi um, humanitarianism in Islamic countries, or if you think about the fact that in Turkey, for example, refugees um, you know, you could only get legally refugee status if you had a European passport, right? So you have then uh, a new kind of humanitarianism which had to be invented, which was Islamic humanitarianism and the obligation which goes because of the fact that these are Muslims. And I was saying that in one interesting question for me uh, would be that there is a critique in a certain sense of the stability of the white man category as the rescuer. But there are no stable narratives about these other forms of humanitarianism which have also been brought into existence, and it would be very interesting to compare. Um, I'm not saying the film should have done it, but I think that it's a very interesting question for me as to you know, what kinds of comparisons would become possible in, in, in making those comparisons. I don't know if I answered or understood your question, um, well, no, but I think I understand your, your answer that humanitarian is seen as, as something like from white men coming somewhere to provide help. And it was also built it up in, in, with, with Médecins Frontières in the past, and maybe that was the message. On the other hand, you know, you have like 90% of all employees in humanitarian are locals who work in the country, who they know the country. Even though, of course, from fundraising perspective, I mean, definitely it's better to, to shoot pictures of, of white people helping black people, let's say. So I understand your point. However, in the movie for, and, and we are talking about the movie now, it, it is a lot of oversimplified thing for oversimplification for me. Yes? Yeah, so. I actually don't take the. Okay, so when I see a movie, I mean, first I don't think this is a documentary in the strict sense of the term, right? So when I see that, I don't actually think it's about a 
transparent, explicit message. I think it's probably about creating a certain kind, or at least that's how it seemed to me, that there's a swirl of affects which are created, right? From disgust to, um, uh, you know, to, um, to sorrow, to shame, to, um, you know, they, I, I could name these and say that it's not an explicit message, it's the swirl of affects that seem to me to be interesting. Whether that is fully successfully created is a question for me. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't judge it in terms of is it, does it have a simplicity of message or a complexity of message? Because it seems to me that that would be assuming a certain kind of um, you know, cinema or verity or something of that kind, which is precisely what it is saying it's not. Which is why the example that I gave, that let's say, um, so if you took a classic film like Letter from a Dead Woman, the signature of the woman is overwritten by the signature of the director, right? So you know that this is, she's not the author in some way. Similarly, it seems to me that what it put into question for me is really the, the manner in which um, the way he puts himself into the film and thereby also um, makes a certain parody to use um, uh, David's term. I would have preferred irony maybe because it creates that distance in a certain sense that irony allows you to do. Um, I mean, I think that what's interesting is that the conceptual soundings which come, come from the moods that it creates and not from its representational ability. Oh. Oh, I also see the movie with some irony, irony or parody movie, yes, but then it depends on context where the movie sure. is actually and sure. for what purpose is also. That, that's a good question. That, um, <coughs> but I didn't get it from the movie, honestly. So. <laughs> so for, me, for me, the context in a certain sense of the fact that this is Congo, the fact that these are companies, the fact that um, 300 years, 200 years back, you know, the, in any village you could find people with their hands cut because they were not, you know, in order to send a message about a particular kind of discipline. And so, I, so to me, that's a deeper genealogy over here. Then uh, you know, then what is there on the surface? And I was trying to get to that deeper genealogy, which is why I keep kind of saying it's not really representation in the strict sense. It brings back uh, you know the swirl of memories, so to say, uh, of uh, what the nature of cruelty and poverty and juxtaposing it with the imperative. And he says at one place. Uh, you know, when he's translating enjoy poverty into um, into French, no, I think mm -hmm. into the, yeah. And he says, no, no, it's the imperative, mm -hmm. right? And that's a fantastically interesting mm -hmm. moment in which you as an audience, um, you know, are in a certain sense being marshaled through an imperative in relationship to the issue of what this overwhelming uh, poverty is about, which is why I don't agree with you that, I mean, first I don't agree that it's about a message in, you know, in a very mechanical communicative model, um, but also it's not simple. I think it's, uh, the, 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 the specificities of the details, uh, it seemed to me create, uh, I mean, what does it mean to say um, enjoy is an imperative? I think, you know, think about it in everyday life, you know, the waiter coming and putting something down on your plate and say, enjoy it, like, you know, you wonder, why is this an imperative, right? And so he's playing on both popular culture, but he's also touching on the deep registers of language over here, uh, as well as memory. Now, I, I agree with you that there are places where it, you know, can't maintain it, that I would agree, and we could have a longer discussion on that. But anyway, that's the, I think, um, but thank you, those were very uh, thoughtful questions. Hello, uh, I have a really boring philosophical question for Professor
this uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm really interested in the answer because I'm a creative. Can you speak a bit slowly? Uh, I'm really interested in the answer of yours because I'm a PhD student uh, concerned with uh, application of late Wittgenstein's ideas in methodology of ethnography and anthropology. And my question is, uh, uh, can we apply uh, late Wittgenstein's idea in the methodology of this film? Because, for example, there was a scene in uh, uh, when the director is explaining the concept of rationality and traditional approach to uh, locals and I think it's really funny because uh, uh, there is a whole uh, rationality debate uh, around this concept and I'm interested in your opinion. Um. Um, so thank you, that's a wonderful uh, question. Uh, because that's actually a very crucial scene, right? Because in Wittgenstein, what you have is um, a certain kind of parodying of what rationality uh, can become when it, what Covell says is that it becomes demonic, right? Uh, so the whole appearance of skepticism in Wittgenstein happens because rationality turns on itself. So when you see this particular thing and he's doing all this cost-benefit analysis and saying instead of doing parties, you should really be taking photographs of more raped women and more, um, you know, more um, 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 uh, malnutrition children, uh, right? And then they're going to this office and he's saying, why can't this be a journalistic enterprise? You, you can see over there that it is, in a certain sense, a particular a way in which rationality, uh, you know, turns demonic. I mean, think about the uh, flight from anything recognizable as human when your uh, commerce becomes a commerce of being able to assimilate or to accumulate more and more pictures of uh, raped women or more and more pictures of malnutrition children, right? So it's performing in a certain sense that critique of the very rationality that he's selling to the, um, you know, to the villagers at that particular moment. And it's, it had, um, you know, it had very strong resoundings for me um, with uh, even more than Wittgenstein, Cavell's reading on Wittgenstein, where he says, um, you know, where he says that what is happening over here is not a contrast between rationality and irrationality, but rationality turning demonic on itself. So yes, thanks. That's a very, I think that's a very perceptive remark. Can I just add a, just a, just a, a comment on that about. Um, not so much about rationality, but picking up from that particular uh, scene or the scenes before to contrast the, the photographs of the marriages and the festivals and, and so on, where it's clear that the, the question of ownership, where the ownership of the image is in a sense with the families and the photographer is the, uh, as, it were, as, as it were, the client. And so it's, it's not, the rationality is one which switches the nature of, of property, um, and very explicitly uh, does so. And I think that's, uh, that's another sort of element of that particular kind of rationality in relation to right. property ownership and the power involved. Maybe one more element, like this demonic, you said this word demonic, and then you see also this reproduction of the system of exploitation of natural resources, gold, and everything that capitalism brings. And he actually brings the same principle into the dealing with the image, right? So he brings the capitalistic logics in, in yeah. dealing with the, with the image of, of the suffering. So yeah. this is this demonic also Marian code of reproduction, actually, of, of uh, this principle. So, uh, He's continuing with it now, actually. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, in Congo, uh, with his Institute of Human Activities, uh, the works that they are making are uh, most often self-portrait of the people. And uh, this self-portrait, um, uh, they are made from cocoa and chocolate and they are sold, sold uh, here in Europe or in, in Belgium and 
uh, exhibited in, for example, in the Fanabe Museum in Eindhoven, which is really interesting. So he's taking their own image uh, made in sculpture and salt here. <laughs> yeah, but there's a difference yeah. between making sculpture and selling it and, you know, assuming that what is saleable is pictures of raped women yeah, or man yeah. child, right? Okay. And so that is the turning that I thought was very... Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by the demonic. Uh, and, in that. Yeah, and, yeah, just uh, finishing. Yeah, I think this is very important because that's what you were talking about, the property of, of who is the owner. He's taking, like, they are not anymore the objects of the photographs, but they are making their images and they are selling it. Um, and you can, you can buy it uh, on his website, which, yeah, for me, it's a bit controversial. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to add that the rationality which turns towards rationality and becomes demonic, that in this particular, this particular scene uh, with the boys who got the cameras and they are trying to make a profit from the, yeah, as been said. I think it's important, the, the meaning of this uh, theme, uh, beside the others, is that it ends with an aesthetic. It ends with the fact that uh, the, the, the director or the main doctor says, but, well, look at the pictures, you know, the taking pictures is not just about uh, uh, clicking the button. And I think that's the point which is being thematized through the whole film. The aesthetic, the, the images, the way we perceive that, and the power of that as well if you follow me, that, that, uh, thank you, thank you, really. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, not Vlad. Like, not Vlad. Pardon? Not Vlad. Sovereign, sovereign governance. The government or the sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty <laughs> of, of 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 images also is uh, is the question of aesthetics and is the question in Western culture of tradition and I think you in in this point you would say a lot to that you know how uh, human or the black people were introduced to Western people uh, during the, the history and what were the images, so. so. So there is a difference between an image and a picture, right? So that in one way, uh, I guess my question here would be that there is, of course, a different aesthetic that is being introduced that, you know, where the camera is and uh, what is it going to focus on. But there is a question over here whether that kind of aesthetic is not premised on what we can say we call a picture rather than an image mm -hmm. of the saleability of, um, you know, of rape. So, so it comes, in a way, I think the closeness of that to pornography, which is not shown, but which seems to me to be part of that aesthetic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is, is what is at stake here. Mm -hmm. which, which is why I think it's not mm -hmm. only, it's not so much about ownership as about circulation, mm -hmm. you know, and the fact that there the is... The pleasure. Itself. Yeah, exactly. But the pleasure is a, is a pornography know. pleasure, yeah. right? That's, that's uh, yeah. connected in, in cinematography. It's yeah, yeah. No more questions? If not, you can discuss. We can. If there are no direct questions, you can ask the panelists after the end if you want. I would like to thank you very much for, your, for coming for your time and also to be here. Thank you.